Hello, everyone. This is the seventh episode of our show, and today I'm going to narrate four scary park ranger horror stories. So sit back and enjoy, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Thanks. <coughs> hmm. I had been working as a forest ranger for almost five years. A ranger's day could consist of anything from collecting firewood to tracking down missing hikers, and my day began like most. I would wake up early, walking into work, grabbing my binoculars. As I was about to drive out of the forest, I got a call that day. I was given a new assignment. I met up with another colleague, a fellow ranger, and we went to the center of this area where somebody had been reporting hearing screaming coming from around a cave system nearby. My partner and me decided that I would be able to handle it by myself. He had other things to do, and this was just another run of the mill investigation for me. After he left, I headed towards that area where there had been several unreported mounds to this cave system. Now, let me give you some information. This cave system runs pretty deep, and there are guided tours. But I also know that this cave system is very expansive, and also having a lot of unidentified entrances and holes that can lean deeper into the system. These are also off-trail. So myself, I've never actually experienced finding more of these. Although I know hikers have reported finding many and even leaving makeshift markers to let other hikers know this was an entrance. The parts of the ground here are also dangerous, meaning if you step on the wrong part the ground below, you could collapse, falling into a tunnel so I had to be very careful about how I approached this entire search. The good news is, I wasn't hearing any screaming, so that could be good or bad news. The bad news meaning the hiker, whoever was stuck there, could have been deceased, but the good news being that maybe the hiker had gotten themselves out anyway. My heart was pounding just by the sheer adrenaline of it. I didn't know why, but something told me to run. It was this feeling in the pit of my gut, as soon as I got there, right around the cavern system, the wind picked up and everything seemed colder than it already was. A gust. Now I could have began my investigation in the main entrance, but as I was planning, I heard the scream. It sounded like a person, but they were maybe a couple hundred feet away north. So I marched through the trees, looking, following the source of the screaming yelling out. Can you hear me? Can you respond? And the screaming ceased. I followed along the rock wall and found this crude hole in the ground. Maybe no larger than five feet? It was right by a rotted tree stump with only one branch on it. This, I knew, probably went down into one of the cave systems. This, by the way, was probably no more than 200 feet away from the main entrance. After crouching down, I was able to slide down at a 45-degree angle into this cave system, landing in a small chamber that I think connected to the others. I always carry a flashlight with me, so I took it out and turned it on. As soon as I did, that the caves plunged into darkness as my battery instantly died. That's when I heard a loud crash. I turned around, or I should say turned to meet the noise, and my flashlight popped back on there. Like, out of some sort of sick Stephen King novel was this grotesque figure. Large black eyes covering its entire body, stretching its arms out and moving toward me and terrified I wanted to turn and run, but didn't have time, as there was another one of these beings coming from the opposite side of the cave approaching. I turned as fast as I could and fled up the 45-degree incline about the cave. Just as I was turning to climb up, I could hear a third one approaching from directly behind me. Now I had one coming from my left, my right, and behind me. This one, as I turned and looked, was larger than the other two, completely terrified out of my mind and the sounds of screaming were now apparent, coming deeper in the cavern. I don't know if it was an injured hiker or if these things were making the noise luring anybody into this tiny crevice, this chamber into the earth. Like I said, the opening to this cavern wasn't large, but I never in a million years would have expected to find things like this. This was horror movie status. I didn't tell anybody else about what I found and kept it to myself. After climbing out of that hole, I ran and 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 I ran some more. Getting back to the station later on, I didn't say a word. And I knew the other rangers wouldn't believe me, and what would I tell them? That I found a cave full of half-arachnids, half-creatures. I mean, they'd probably think I was crazy. 
I've kept this sacred for a while, but how long can I keep it from the rest of the world? Will my story ever be told to other people, or should I just stay quiet about what had happened? Let me just apologize and say I'm sorry for the formatting of the story. I'm a terrible writer, and I am not a storyteller. So I apologize in advance, but these creatures that I saw were unlike anything I've ever seen. They really reminded me if you crossed a tarantula with a human. I mean, these were gross. They made this hissing, clicking noise, too. I know it sounds phony through, but it's really hard for me to convey emotion properly. At least, through a written communication with all the information coming out anymore about missing hikers and seeing strange figures and shapes in the woods, and all the other bizarre happenings of 2020, I figured, hey... Maybe now is an okay time to be open about my experiences and hopefully not experience backlash. My wife, son, and I were traveling in a remote area on old logging roads looking for Indian trials that some old-timer had told us about. It was midweek and had not seen a soul. The Tarion is Steep Hills Douglas, firs and pine trees... We came around a corner, and to our surprise, and the creatures had the encounter. The creature was running up the hill away from us. My first thought bear. He was on all fours. Midway, he stopped, looked, and began to side-hill the mountain, this time on his back two legs. The only time I saw him make gowned contact with his front legs, arms, was his inside arm for balance. I toyed with the idea of following the creature, but my withwife made it clear she had seen enough. I'm an avid woodsman. I have seen a lot of bear. This was not a bear. I understand now why nobody has shot one of these big boys. Very human-like. My plans are to return for a few days this summer with a good camera. Wish me luck. When the call about the missing campers and the abandoned campsite came in... I was sitting in front of the park ranger station, watching a fire that crackled in the rusted old pit that's been here for decades. The flames were slowly eating the wood. The heat occasionally sputtered and spat as the pine logs were devoured. It's one of my favorite ways to pass the time out here. A fire, like watching fish in an aquarium or animals in a zoo, is endlessly captivating because it's a tiny bit of nature captured and put on display. The same reason people come here to the Spruce Ridge National Park. And just like a fire, the woods here can scorch you if you're not careful. I shuffled back inside, took the call, and headed out for the rendezvous point after listening to the report for a few minutes. Another couple gone missing. Nothing too out of the ordinary, at least not yet. So I loaded my gun, hopped in my jeep, and headed out as the sun began to recede past the trees. The searing summer sun peeked out from between dense fur limbs that surrounded the rocky terrain on all sides, sweeping over the horizon as far as I could see. I passed glimmering ponds filled with algae and pavilions filled with brown picnic benches as the jeep bounced up and down on carefully maintained blacktop and rutted brown roads filled with dirt and rock. I could practically hear the croak of frogs, the chirping of crickets, and the hum of a few dragonflies as I sped past. No matter how long I was a park ranger, I never got used to the thrill of the great outdoors. The serenity you could find in the fresh air was eternal, as was its sheer size. It reminds me of pioneer days when it was just a few families alone in the vastness of the frontier, and it was a very unforgiving frontier. Back then, there were no rangers or park security like me to make sure no families got lost. First aid didn't exist, and Mother Nature never suffered fools. Some people have forgotten that, but Mother Nature never hesitates to remind people about what she can do. Lately, she seems particularly active on that front in these parts. I carefully maneuvered the jeep through hills, which were bigger the farther I got away from the base. The wind lashed through the cracked windows as I passed fallen cedar trees on the way to my destination. I loved these woods, but... I never forget how merciless they can be, and how many people have met their end out here. How many bodies have been buried right here? How many people went out into these woods and simply never came out? There's no way of knowing for sure, but these woods have been around for centuries, and that's enough time for death to plant a seed for every tree out here. I was dispatched to find Libby and Dale Morrison, 
a well-to-do couple that had gone out on a camping vacation. Their empty campsite had been found by a group of hikers, and since no one had seen the couple for a few days, I was sent out to take a closer look. Funny enough, while I've always loved the outdoors, I've never liked camping. If you fill out enough missing persons and death reports, you learn fast to treat the woods like a tiger or lion. They might be stunning to look at, but never forget what can happen when you encounter them. Although plenty of people have wised up and learned how to camp safely, camping certain places alone is a bit like putting out a candy bowl on Halloween with a please take one, signed with no one to watch. Not everyone who walks by has to ignore the rule and do whatever they please. All it takes is one. It may have only taken one person to make my brother-in-law, Jerry, vanish a few weeks ago. National parks seem so humdrum and tame, but anyone who works at one knows there's a lot of dark things that happen within those trees. Cults will meet here. Drug deals go down and go wrong. People vanish, and plenty of murders all happen within these woods. Bodies are dumped here and found days, weeks, or even months later, all torn to pieces from the animals, and no coroner could figure out how they got that way. I've interviewed plenty of applicants who think this job is some cakewalk and an easy paycheck. They all get a nasty wake-up call sooner or later, and it either sobers them up or makes them run out of here like they've been chased out. And I've seen things that I don't blame them for wanting to run from. People have been afraid of monsters in the woods for centuries. I don't expect that to change anytime soon, no matter what modern technology exists. That's why the single best alarm system that ever existed is man's best friend. The minute a dog starts barking, you know someone or something is there. But when you're outside and your dog whimpers and runs away like the ground is on fire, that's your cue to get out? It's no coincidence that in all the time I've been on duty here, I've never had to deal with a situation where one or more person involved had a dog. Never, back at the station that houses my office, there's an entire bulletin board with missing persons flyers. Most of them are couples or entire families. Wholesome-looking, happy, and smiling at the camera. Like they don't have a camera, like they don't have a care in the world, which is usually how they end up on the wall in the first place. I was about to find out whether the Morrisons would join them. It's not a task I enjoy at all. In the five years I've had this job, I've taken off maybe ten of those flyers. And not because the people on them were found safe and sound either. Most people on it are the type of people who think because they have GPs and cars with all the latest bells and whistles. There's nothing to worry about when you camp or venture into the woods. A lot of people who venture out here have that attitude. If they're lucky, they realize the mistake and live to talk about it. Other times, not so much, but maybe their fate can help teach others a lesson. I've certainly had to deal with my share of journalists, documentary filmmakers, law enforcement officers from various divisions, private investigators, and inquiring relatives and friends. The professionals I have no problem dealing with, they're just doing a job, same as me. That's not to say they don't take what happened seriously or feel bad for the parties involved. Not at all. But they're used to dealing with stuff like this for the most part, and it rarely touches them personally. Only rarely do I see the look in their eye that tells that what happened here will haunt them. On the other hand, dealing with family members in that situation is by far the worst part of my job. I'd rather stumble upon a million bodies than have to deal with grieving family members. I've done it too many times, but it never gets any easier. Never. And it shouldn't. It was dark by the time I arrived at the Morrison campsite, which was a long way from any main area. As expected, they had spared no expense and had gone camping with brand new gear that I was certain they had just bought. Brand new equipment, cooking gear, and a black SUV that was still gleaming like it was fresh off the lot. I did have to concede that Mr. and Mrs. Morrison picked a terrific spot right on the lake. It was a clear night and the moon glistened off the calm surface, which looked like glass. No matter what happened on the job, nighttime was always my favorite time to work or do anything else, so long as I took proper precautions. I suppose it's the same reason people think about hitting up an old flame late at night. In the modern era, it's easy to look down upon more primitive times and their fears about what lay just out of sight in the darkness. But come out here at night when it's pitch dark, and those fears suddenly become far more relatable. Modern technology may be the 21st century, but where your flashlight ends, it's the 19th century. 
All it takes is for your flashlight to run out of batteries, your GPs to fail, or your car to not start, and you're no longer in modern times out here. You're right back where your ancestors were. But at least they knew how to survive in conditions like that. As I looked around the campsite, the stars gleamed out of the sky and looked brighter than usual. I don't think people think about space, as in really think about it and what it entails. It's a stunning concept to behold, the vastness of the galaxy and all the galaxies beyond it. When you think about it, Earth is nothing more than a tiny apartment in a massive skyscraper when you think of how massive space is. The phrase outer space invokes gargantuan size and a scale that is unfathomable. When pondering this, the two most terrifying concepts in their implication are that you are completely alone in the universe, and you are not alone in the universe. Which one is more terrifying depends a lot on the person. The phrase in space, no one can hear you scream, is so much more than a movie tagline. It's a simple fact. Because not only can no one hear you scream, you might not even be able to scream, which is one of the most horrifying feelings a human can experience. It's like calling for an ambulance, only to be told help isn't coming. The woods are the same way, as it's no coincidence they refer to space as the final frontier. It's also what makes someone going missing in a huge park like this such a nightmare for a search party. In a populated area, you can rule areas out and narrow things down, but out here in the woods, someone could be literally anywhere. The Morrison campsite wasn't torn to shreds like it had been attacked by a wild animal, nor did it resemble the scene of a horror movie-style bloodbath. It looked like countless campsites that had been abandoned without an afterthought. Had it not been for their car nearby, I would have thought they just left on a whim. Their car, a shiny black Cadillac SUV with a grill hood that gleamed in the light from my flashlight, was still here. So that meant they either left in someone else's car, they ran off somewhere outside the park, or they were still here. But it wouldn't be the first time I've seen couples ditch one vehicle out here to get in another. So the question was, what caused the Morrisons to flee from where they'd set up shop? It certainly wasn't because they needed to use a bathroom. In my experience... People almost always flee due to fear, but fear of what? I scanned the area slowly with my flashlight. The Morrisons certainly spared no expense. The RV was top of the line, certainly a step up from sleeping in a tent. You don't leave equipment like this for no reason, especially if you're someone with money. A quick check revealed that none of the car's tires had been slashed, and from all appearances it looked to be in good condition. Since the RV's front door was halfway open, I wasted no time in climbing the metal steps and peering inside. As expected, everything inside was top of the line. Most of it looked like they had just bought it at the store a week ago. I carefully climbed inside, and with one hand on my gun, I slowly checked the bathroom and bedroom. The bathroom was a jumbled mess of tubes and bottles, and the bed was unmade. But everything was perfectly in order. Nor did it look like anything was stolen— I stepped back outside and started to walk towards my jeep to radio what I had seen. But when I was over halfway there, the skin on my arms prickled and I felt a chill run down my back. Despite the billowing humidity, I was chilled to the bone. I took a deep breath, carefully placed one hand back on my gun, and carefully walked the remaining distance, taking care to keep my back aligned with the RV, as I had the sense I was being watched. I had felt this sensation before, and you never get used to it, and just like dealing with grieving families, you shouldn't. Because if you do, the next grieving family may be yours. With paranoia and fear growing with each step, I mercifully made it to the Jeep Oak and slammed the door shut. Before I radioed back to the base, I leaned back in the driver's seat and tried to relax. As I took another deep breath and reminded myself to remain calm, I surveyed the terrain again. No car tracks aside from mine or the Morrisons, no evidence of a struggle, and no sign of any other life out here. But that didn't mean nothing else was out here besides me. As if to answer me, a guttural roar burst out from the woods to my right, and I practically shot out of my seat. It was the ugliest sound I've ever heard, and there was no way a human was capable of making that noise. It was the kind of sound that seems to be a living, breathing, physical entity, like thunder. Without waiting another moment, I started the engine, 
floored the gas pedal, and the jeep roared to life as I drove out of there as fast as I could. As I pulled away, I swear I could see the trees where the roar came from tremble slightly. It wasn't until I had been driving for about ten minutes that I noticed some heavy breathing that sounded pain. When I realized it was mine, I tried to take a deep breath and calm down. Once I had done the former and was attempting the latter, I picked up my radio with a clammy hand and called in what I found and heard. I was surprised, as my voice was far calmer than I felt. On the other line, my colleague sounded surprised, but not skeptical. Maybe it was sincere, or maybe when I had backup and we all headed back there together, we might find nothing, and they might just declare me paranoid. I didn't really care either way. I'd much rather be called paranoid than a crime statistic. I rolled along at a good pace until I rounded a corner, and a figure standing in the middle of the road made me slam on the brakes. In the harsh light from the vehicle's headlights, I could see the figure was slight, wearing badly tattered clothes and was pretty beat up. But when the figure took a step forward, I couldn't believe it. It was my brother-in-law, Jerry. Jerry, I rolled down my window in shock. What the hell is going on? Bobby, we gotta go. Get in, I said before he ran unsteadily towards the passenger seat. The minute he sat down, I hit the gas and we roared out of there. He panted for a good thirty seconds before his breathing evened out. What happened, Jerry? I asked, after he had a chance to rest. There's something out here, Bobby. Some kind of creature. A monster. Like something out of a TV show. And there's this group of people that know about it and treat it like it's real important. They think it's so important they even kidnap people and offer it to the monster to eat. That's what happened to me. What kind of monster is it? It was the only thing I could think of to ask. I don't know. How did you get away? Remember that knife you got me for Christmas last year? The one you can store anywhere? That's right. I had it in my shoe at the time they grabbed me. Once I had a chance, I put it to good use. And here you are, saving my neck again. I'll never be able to repay you. His voice broke as he spoke. I always liked you, Jerry. Not like Tyler, Marianne's last boyfriend. The sentence was barely out of my mouth when the car went around a bend, and I had to slam on the brakes again. But this time the sight was far more chilling, as the road was filled with people wearing identical monochromatic black plastic masks, the kind you get in bulk at a party store. They also wore plain black hooded sweatshirts with the hoods pulled up. No one moved an inch as I stopped. They all just stood there facing me. All twenty-five of them, then almost on command. They all stormed command. They all started walking at once towards my vehicle. That was the only cue I needed to start the car and run right through them. Or that was my plan before out of the corner of my eye. I saw a blur of color and two of the masked people went flying and slammed into trees. When they landed, both of them were sporting deep scratches that were bleeding. This made the others stop immediately before they started to flee in opposite directions. But that wasn't enough because more of them fell prey to whatever was out there, which I couldn't see. Either way, I hit the gas harder than I ever had in my life, and it wasn't long before the screaming and wailing was a faint background noise. What's the matter? Jerry gleefully called out from the cracked window. Can't handle what you tried to do to me. The two of us didn't say a word to each other until we reached the park ranger station. Gathered around the front were a few of my colleagues. But two of the people were dressed casually and matched the description of the Morrisons, whose campsite I was sent to check out. My face must have showed my surprise, because Mrs. Morrison walked over to me and shook my hand. Libby Morrison, paranormal investigator. My husband and I were investigating the rumors of strange occurrences out here, and we left the campsite abandoned in order to try to record what happened. Well, congrats, you found something was all I said before I briefly explained what happened and left it to the professionals. Altogether, the bodies of ten masked people were pulled from the park. The rest were rounded up by law enforcement and charged with various things. And while that was going on, I handed in my resignation while Jerry went home with my sister. I eventually got another job related to the outdoors, but this time it was job related to outdoor retail. Wife and I traveled from K Falls to a spring in the area. Walking back to car, heard two different screams coming from two different directions like they were yelling back and forth to locate each other. 
both passed with in 100 yards on both sides of us. Met at Creek and the screams ended. They headed south by southwest. I went back next day, found high tree limbs broken off, tracks at water's edge, went to area the first screams came from, found large rocks that were thrown around, found a large pile of scat. It was very large, not a bear, seen lots of that. Very dark grass, fat ticks, ants, small bones. Then I felt something watching me and the need to run. My husband is a park ranger like I, and he has seen more than I have and has witnessed more things than he can explain. Currently, I'm on the East Coast and my husband is on the West. We have parks in common, and we have parks that are different. I'm also kind of a park naturalist and have been in many places in the parks that most people have not gone to. The thing that struck me the most is that I could not explain was when I worked at Canyonlands National Park. I was working at the island and the Sky Visitor Center. It was around the time when Canyonlands National Park was getting a lot of attention due to the statuses of Dark Sky Sanctuary. I had many people from the public come and ask me questions about how to see the night sky. One couple came in and spent quite some time talking about the stars and planets. The man of the couple, probably around 30 years of age, left for a moment to go to the bathroom. His girlfriend asked, are we close to a skinwalker ranch? I was quite taken aback and replied, we are quite a distance away, probably over an hour's drive. They told me that's a good thing because they are not what they say they are. I asked her what are they, and she said they were stalking, manipulative, dangerous creatures, but she could not tell me much more. She acted very strange and very fidgety, almost like a drug addict would while they were feeding. It was very strange behavior, but I doubt she was on drugs because she was very coherent. And even though what she was saying was creepy, it wasn't exactly drug talk. We spoke for a few more minutes, then her boyfriend returned and they left. I still wonder about that encounter and what she meant. It sounded like she knew something. I've often thought about it. I would love to know more about what she knew about them specifically, but I attribute that encounter to a different thing altogether. Again, I've been doing this job for well over 20 years, and while I've had some strange experiences like that, I've never exactly seen a ghost or some sort of demon before. My second story. So this happened around the same time. I was working night and actually walking back to one of my vehicles, not my personal vehicle, by the way, and maybe about 35 yards into the woods, I heard my name being called by a voice that sounds very familiar. I could not quite put my finger on who it was, but I knew the voice from somewhere, but they were very softly calling my name from in the woods. Immediately, this struck every wrong chord in my body because I knew that whoever this person was, it did not mean well if you catch my drift. And how do they know my name? They were clearly stalking me something. Everything about the situation was bad. I called out to them showing my light and my gun demanding they show themselves. I realized once I stopped talking just how quiet the night was. Even the crickets had ceased their noise making. I quickly backed my way to my vehicle and drove out of there. I don't know what that was or who that was, but I'm glad I did not find out. 